Hello everybody, it would appear I have become the very thing I sought to destroy because today on the channel I'm going to be introducing you to my very first ever SUV and in this episode we'll be talking about what it is that I've bought, whether I might have accidentally picked up something rather special, if I'm going to deeply, deeply regret it and why I think this particular car has a very good chance of being the next big thing. All this and more after some funky music. <laughs> I'm sure you all hate needlessly long, overly tedious reveals as much as I do. So let's get straight to the point. It will not surprise anybody who's been watching the channel over the last few months to know that I have developed something of a fondness for the first generation Porsche Cayenne. And for once, I've taken my own advice because that is exactly what I've bought. This one to be precise. In case you've not been watching, why the Cayenne? Well, this all started a few months ago when a chap called Mark got in touch and said to me, James, would you like to borrow my first generation Cayenne Turbo and live with it for a week to see just how you get on with it? Previous to that, I had absolutely no experience of the model whatsoever. The only Cayenne I'd driven was the top of the line Turbo SE hybrid of the current generation. And like many, for me, this early car was one that I had absolutely no interest whatsoever in owning. But when I was offered the drive of it for a week, I thought, you know, this couldn't really hurt. Actually, that turned out not to be true. It hurt quite a bit because I completely fell for that car. The reason being simple. Despite all of its many failings, the early KN is a car that simply exudes charm. Now, I appreciate that sounds like a very vague, wishy-washy thing to say about any car, but there is a lot else very measurable about the Cayenne that I really did appreciate. Like the fact that for me, it's just about the perfect size. In other words, it's about as big as you'd comfortably want any car to be for the back roads of Britain. In fact, during research for a video on the Macan, I actually found that the first generation Cayenne is closer in size to that, the current small Porsche SUV, than it is the current day Cayenne. It's about 4.8 metres long and 1.9 metres wide, meaning it's just about the same size as a Jaguar F-Pace, which Wikipedia humorously calls a compact, and it's closer in size to a BMW X3 than it is an X5. For my American viewers, this is about the same size as a two-row Chevrolet Blazer. But perhaps most importantly, unlike many modern day crossovers, this is not a reverse TARDIS. It's big outside, but also big inside. Rear passengers in particular still have ample legroom, more so than you might expect. And the boot is just about the right size too, for myself or I imagine just about anybody else. This is a car that is genuinely practical. And I really appreciate the fact that although we all know underneath this is a VW Touareg, Porsche really did go to considerable length to make it feel like a genuinely bespoke product. Just about nothing on here you'd recognize from the VW, it has its own distinct look outside and in. Naturally, this having the Porsche badge up the front, the company wanted to make sure that the Cayenne still retained some sporting credentials. And in many ways, this car was truly groundbreaking. You have to remember back in 2003, the most powerful of all Range Rovers you could buy was the then newly introduced L322 with a 286 horsepower V8. Only a year before, the best you could have got with the old P38A was a 220 horsepower version with the Rover V8 in it. This, in turbo guys, had a 4.5 litre, making 450 horses. Supercar performance for the day. And later, as more powerful rivals appeared, the car gained a Turbo S variant with 520 horses. But in spite of the car's mighty on-road performance, Porsche decided, bravely or foolishly, they didn't want to compromise the car's off-road abilities either. So to that end, every KN was gifted with standard fit, permanent four-wheel drive, a progressively locking centre differential and a low-range transfer box. A great number of these were also fitted with height adjustable air suspension, which by default gives the car a wading depth of over 20 inches. There was also an optional off-road package that gifted you extra underbody protection and another locking differential. This one even has PDCC, Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, essentially active anti-roll bars. And when it knows it's off-road, they can completely disconnect themselves to give the suspension extra articulation. That's quite cool. 
and I suspect entirely unnecessary, because when new, just about nobody actually took their Cayenne off-road, and that might have something to do with the fact that they were quite expensive. The base model cost £35,000, which in today's money is just under 60 grand, and the turbo double that, retailing for a modern-day equivalent of 115 grand. No surprise then, they weren't really seen down a country lane. But today, I think many are thankful for all the effort Porsche went to, because the Cayenne seems to be enjoying a second lease of life as an overlanding favourite. Because these suffered pretty brutal depreciation fairly early on, you can pick up an example of even a Cayenne Turbo now from just about two or three thousand pounds. And if you don't believe me, check the classifieds. I've seen them. I'm not saying you should buy one, but they are out there. And it's because these cars strike such a great balance between being very capable, also common enough that you can get parts and therefore support for them, but also affordable that they are quickly replacing the cheap Range Rover as the go-to favourite of the overlanding crowd. I've seen many people start to stick knobbly tyres and big lights and roof bars on these and start having fun with them. And to me, I think that's a fabulous thing because this is a car that deserves to go on an adventure. But even if you don't want to take this car trekking, you're still sure to appreciate its all-weather, all-road ability, as I did when I borrowed Mark's, because that was at a time when we had some of the coldest and worst weather in recent memory, and the KN took all of that in its stride. I had a few very important appointments to get people to, and at no point did I feel the KN was going to fail to get there. It even does a reasonably good job of being a nice place to sit too. The KN was Porsche's first real attempt to try and move their interiors up market after the relative disappointment that was the 986 and 996. This is a car that has a lot going for it and certainly offers huge value for money. So what exactly is it that I've bought? Percy, and yes it has been named, more on that in a little bit, is a 2007 Cayenne Turbo, making him a very early example of the short-lived facelift that was in production from just 2007 until the very end of 2009, during which time we had the global financial crisis, so sales of a big thirsty off-roader weren't quite as good as Porsche likely hoped. On paper, the facelift doesn't really bring all that much. Slightly bigger engines, different lights, different bumpers. However, there are more than enough changes which add up to a car that I think is worth shelling out a little extra for. Visually, the new light arrangement, front and rear, which introduces a number of LED elements, I think really lifts the looks of the car and makes it actually a fairly handsome thing. Previously, I'd never really considered the KN to be pretty, quite the opposite, but in facelift guys, I think it just about works. Perhaps more importantly though is the engine, which in all cases grew slightly. The base V6 went from a 3.2 to a 3.6, but the far more common V8 grew from 4.5 to 4.8 litres, regardless of whether you had a naturally aspirated or turbo variant. Of course, this came with a slight power increase, so the turbo went from 450 to 500 horses as standard, with 516 pound-foot of torque. That's 700 newton metres. But that isn't why you'd want one. Instead, it's because these engines were also considered more reliable. The early V8s have a reputation for failure in a very expensive and sometimes terminal way. Though these 4.8s are not trouble free, they are generally regarded as being quite a bit better. The facelift also brought with it a raft of changes under the skin that were aimed at improving the overall quality and reliability of the car, and the general consensus seems to be that they worked, because the facelift is considered to be an easier car to live with. So fairly early on I decided that is what I wanted. However, when it came to engine, the decision wasn't quite so clear. The facelift introduced a GTS variant for the KN, which had the most powerful version of the naturally aspirated engine, making around 400 horsepower. I drove one of those recently, and that was part review, part fact-finding mission, at the end of which I came to the conclusion that for me, the turbo was the one to have. The simple fact is, I wanted to be able to buy a GTS because I was going to get a little bit more for my money. However, where in most cars 400 horsepower from a near 5 litre V8 would be adequate, in the KN it is not, for the simple reason that that engine is paired to a, by modern standards, somewhat old-fashioned six-speed automatic gearbox and has to drag around 
two and a half tons. So to me, for the performance you'd expect from a top of the line SUV, you have to go the turbo route. My hunt began in earnest around January time. However, it didn't go very well. I set myself an upper budget of around 10,000 pounds because in my mind, if you started spending much more than that, you probably could get a car which really would appeal to me a lot more. And under 10 grand, the Cayenne was sensational value for money that I really would struggle to beat, especially as I'd kind of set my heart on buying one of these, not knowing really how long I was going to have it. However, as I decided I wanted a facelift turbo, things weren't quite so simple because most of those started at around about 11 or 12,000 pounds. And I went to look at a couple that were not good cars. They were scabby with almost no service history, pretty poor paintwork, dodgy modifications, and um, they just weren't looked after. And those, by the way, were cars at dealers. So I was beginning to think that maybe I would have to compromise and get a GTS. That was until this car's owner, Lee, got in touch. He actually emailed me at the end of last year, telling me he'd bought this car as his new winter wheels. I'd previously reviewed something else of his, an M5, and he wanted to know what I thought of the Cayenne. But as I had a lot going on at the time, and then I got the offer of the other turbo, which I could live with, I went with that and kind of forgot about this. But when I released that first video and said, actually, I'm kind of thinking about buying a car, Lee got back in touch and said, by the way, James, I've now had my fun with the Cayenne and I'm thinking of moving it on. The specification is fairly basic. It's black, black interior, no sunroof of any description, which is a disappointment to me, but I know a selling point to others. And uh, though it doesn't really have all that much trick, it's got the air ride suspension, standard on a turbo, xenon headlights, and PDCC, the active anti-roll bar. It also has this sticker down here, which does hint at this being something a little bit special. So is it? Well, that's best answered out there. It's definitely not standard, I can tell you that much. I can also tell you that it's a car that hasn't ever had an accident, has genuine mileage, currently just over 130,000, has no outstanding finance or anything else. And I can tell you all of that because I also took my own advice by doing a car vertical search before parting with any money. Not that I didn't trust Lee, but when it comes to a vehicle such as this, a 17-year-old used purchase, it's better to be safe than sorry. And as ever, if you are on the hunt, don't forget, by using my link in the description or comment section down below, you'll be able to get yourself 10% off a car vertical search, which will take just 60 seconds and give you all the information you want to know. They also have a new mobile app, so wherever you are, you can get access to all that information. So then, James, have you bought a roof? Well, no, not at all. This is a 2007 KN Turbo, and the story I was told is that it has a roof exhaust and a roof map. I totally believe that the exhaust and map are not standard because this doesn't sound particularly standard. The turbo by default is quite muted, and it doesn't go like a standard car either. This thing really, really shifts. And one of the things I love about the Cayenne is that when you find the appropriate piece of road, it does genuinely deliver a far more exciting and sporting drive than you think something that weighs two and a half tons really should. This car is also helped by the fact it's got a set of Michelin Latitude tyres on it rather than some cheap, dodgy-looking items that you tend to find on old Cayennes. The wheels, incidentally, are 20-inch Sport Techno items, and they were one of the key selling points because the alloys you get on many Cayenne turbos I just don't like. They're a fussy design that, to my eyes, just don't work. So having these as part of the deal definitely saved me quite a bit of money because if I bought a Cayenne turbo with the regular alloys, they would certainly be changed. By being 20s rather than 21s, you would also hope they give you a little bit more compliance, but in honesty, this car is a touch firmer than I think it should be. When it's not being challenged, it's lovely, plush and nice, particularly in comfort mode, but over those broken pieces of road that we seem to have a lot of, especially after the recent freeze, it does struggle a bit. It is for that reason that today it is going off for its service, and there's quite a few things that need to be looked at. So, gentlemen, and ladies, I invite you now to place your bets as to how much this car is about to cost me. 
What does it need? Well, first off, a major service, though not including spark plugs. Lee, the legend that he is, actually did the plugs for me after I'd agreed to buy the car and had beaten him up on price and uh, just wanted to do it because he felt they needed doing. He also fitted a new starter motor, so that is not a concern. And one thing I have to say, this car is in excellent cosmetic condition. It's not perfect. There are a few little issues here and there, but the overall standard of the paintwork is much higher than most other KNs out there of this vintage. I want to say a special thank you also to Terry of RJH Coatings. I went and visited a friend down in Essex, and Terry sorted me out with a little bit of a valet, got a bit of wax on the car, and I've got to say, it turned out really, really nicely. So, car needs full service minus spark plugs. It hasn't been serviced for about 20,000 miles, so it's currently bang on due. I have got with this car a large history folder. This was another selling point, and it dates back about 12 or 13 years, showing a fairly decent and consistent spend. I know the brakes and pads, front and rear, are fairly new. I know the air suspension has had some attention. I know the active anti-roll bars have had some attention. So hopefully, those are all areas that won't need anything done. I do, however, suspect I'm not going to get away entirely scot-free when it comes to the suspension, because one thing about this car, it creaks a lot. You may have heard it in the shot where the car was pulling away, but at low speeds in particular, this thing sounds like a pirate ship. Just about everything creaks and squeaks. You raise the car, it creaks. You lower the car, it creaks. You turn the wheel, it creaks. I think some bushes, ball joints and things may need a bit of grease or replacement, but uh, yeah. That does irk me, so it needs sorting. It's a bit embarrassing, to be honest with you. The soft close for the boot at the back has also packed up, which I know has happened with this car before and I believe is a fairly common KN thing. I'm not sure it's necessarily a hardware issue. It might actually be software. Everyone seems to imply that it's something you can fix with a computer, but that still takes a little bit of time. The car also does seem to have a minor oil leak and I am concerned it might be burning a little bit of oil too. This is what I was greeted with when I started the car the other day. Now, during normal operation, there is no smoke from the car, and the vast majority of times I've gone to start it, I haven't seen anything untowards. It might be that a little bit of oil had settled in a cylinder or something like that, I really don't know. It was only on one bank that it was giving me anything remotely suspicious, so that does narrow down where the problem may be. In any case, I'm hoping it's something relatively simple and not something devastatingly, horrendously awful that's going to cost me as much to fix as the car did to buy, because um, that would be quite upsetting. In terms of the actual cost of the service, I don't think it's actually going to be all that much. In fact, when I've researched these cars, one of the things I've been surprised about is how reasonable they are. I fully expected a major service on one of these to be like a thousand pounds, 1500 quid, something like that. It's not, it's usually about 500. Though, if that's because they're not including all the things you'd expect in a major service, I couldn't say, and I'm likely to find out soon. Obviously, this being a first-gen KN, buying and servicing this car are only two parts of the reason these are considered very, very expensive things. The other being fuel economy, and the turbo, as you might imagine, has the worst of them all. But in the last few days, I've been driving the car around quite a bit on some fairly ordinary journeys, doing a lot of motorway stuff, and it's actually pleasantly surprised me. You see, previously, the last two times I'd driven an early KN, one was the GTS, where I had the car for a few hours, in which time I was doing my review, and those aren't circumstances in which you're going to get an optimistic or accurate economy figure. And the other time was with Mark's Turbo, and there, the trip computer wasn't working properly, so it was giving me a wildly over-optimistic figure. This, though, over about a four to 500 mile average, did see just over 20 to the gallon, which I'll admit is not maybe an impressive figure for most, but for something that weighs two and a half tons and allegedly, according to the sticker, makes 600 horsepower and has permanent all-wheel drive, I think is not that bad. It means that it's only as bad as my 430 rather than quite as bad as the F12, which initially I had feared. That's on a run in case you're wondering, does 15 and a half to the gallon? <laughs>
So then, that's a general introduction and look at the car. What are my plans for it once it returns from the service, hopefully without having bankrupted me? Well, my initial plans are not to keep it. Not because I don't like it, not because I've made a horrible decision. Instead, because I've decided that this car could be put to better use elsewhere. You see, when I had the first turbo, the one from Mark, my sister had a little bit of a look at it and went, hmm, I've always really wanted one of those, always been tempted, but never wanted to buy one on account of how much they might cost to run. So, while I was looking at this car, I had that in the back of my mind and I thought, hmm, do I actually want to buy a KN for myself? Do I not? Not, I'm not so certain. And then I thought, you know what? I'm sure she could have a little bit of use out of it. She could run it around for a few months and maybe I'd persuade her that actually she could run and drive one of these. Though the fuel economy is going to be vastly worse than what she's used to, she has an EcoBoost Fiesta, she doesn't actually do that many miles. So her overall spend over the year isn't going to go up dramatically by my silly petrol heady standards. I might leave a fuel card in it. Anyway, I took the car to her recently, showed it to her, and she absolutely fell in love with it. Another reason that I went with a facelift car was I did have this at the back of my mind, and a benefit of the later cars is that they come with Isofix, which is of nearly no consequence to me, but if you have kids, it's very, very important. And just to make sure this car was suitable for somebody with young children, I had my good friend Ben from Dad Cars come up and do a review, which I'll put a link to in the description down below and up here if I can remember. If you're not familiar, Ben is the lovely chap who, when he had his third child, instead of buying a nice, sensible SUV like this, bought a DB9. Because he looked at it and went, well, everyone says those seats in the back are only good for kids. I've got kids. Why can't I have a DB9? And I think that's a very, very healthy attitude to take. He wants to make sure that every journey in his cars for his children is memorable. And I think that's an admirable thing that he's doing. Anyway, if you'd like to know more about this car from the viewpoint of a young father, please check Ben's video out and make sure to give his channel a subscribe. I'm sure he'll greatly appreciate it. He's been helping me a lot with various things lately, so I'm very grateful for all of his support. In case you hadn't worked it out, my sister is also the one that named it. I don't name cars, it's unwise, you get attached to them, and then bad things happen and it's like the family pet. You love them while they're there, but when they're gone, it rips your heart in two. Now, it's got parking sensors, have I mentioned that? It's got parking sensors, front and rear, and they do work. One of which is currently a bit oversensitive because there is a camera right next to it, so it thinks I'm constantly just about to hit a wall. But the sum total of all of what I'm saying is a win-win for everybody because it means I've been able to buy a KN which is in generally very good condition from somebody that I trusted. It was honestly getting a little bit worrying because all the cars I looked at just weren't great examples and I didn't want to compromise by buying an early one or a non-turbo. I may have neglected somewhat to tell my sister that the car I've bought her to take the kids two miles down the road to nursery is a 600 horsepower 4.8 litre twin turbo v8 but um i'm sure that's a very very little consequence she doesn't like driving fast so um it's not a worry it's nippy that's what i've said it's nippy The car was also surprisingly cheap to insure. Because I have a trade policy, I don't really tend to know how much cars actually cost to insure. This though, because my sister was driving it, I had to get a separate policy for, and for her, my mother, and myself to be on, it cost just over 600 pounds. That was fully comprehensive with all modifications declared, and I thought, that was pretty good value. I have also already done a deal to get the infotainment upgraded. This was one of the reasons that I went with a KN, because Porsche have just released a new system they call PCCM Plus, which fits in where the original one does, and on the face of it looks like an original setup, but has Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and the like. So when in a few months my sister throws this back at me for being a horrible, horrible choice for a school bus, I'll be able to use it, drive it, and enjoy it with all the modern functionality that I would like in a car. 
However, my hope is that she'll grow quite attached to it because this will then allow me to go and buy something else for my daily driver. I know for ages I've been harping on about buying a nice big sensible four-seater and for the last month and a half this has been that and a fabulous job it has done too. This will be put into service for doing many family outings and things where having the nice big comfy interior will be of great benefit. We all went out for Mother's Day, five of us in the car the other day and it was superb. So I am really, really glad that I've bought it. But let's all be honest here. This car is not me. I'm not an SUV person. So for that reason, though technically I could have kept this for myself and also maintained the 968 in the fleet, I'm not going to do that. The 968 is still up for sale. It's going to go over to Flat 6 Performance shortly where it'll be advertised and listed and hopefully sold. And that will then let me get something for myself that's a little bit more JM, a little bit more petrol heady. I've got a few ideas already, but if you happen to have any, please pop into the comment section down below and tell me what you think I should be buying as my next daily driver. Until then, though, here is another car that has kind of joined the fleet, and although you may not be seeing it all that much, it will be making regular appearances. I'm going to keep you up to date with all the stuff that we do to it, with the modifications, the new nav unit, and all that sort of stuff. And, of course, I'll be giving you the occasional update on how Michelle's getting on with owning and driving a dirty, great, big Porsche Cayenne Turbo. Anyway, that's enough from me. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and... I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.